Uh, I need to introduce to you Dr. Bledsoe, Dr. Laura Bledsoe. Um, she is going to give us a very good presentation. Uh, Dr. Bledsoe first came to Colorado to study animal science at Colorado State University and stayed on at Colorado State to attend veterinary school. Now, you didn't just get to go and attend. That leaves a, a misunderstanding there. You had to have straight A's. You had to go through an interview. You had to take a vet, tech, a vet uh, aptitude test. You don't just go to veterinary school. So there's no confusion. After graduating, she took a position as a mixed animal practitioner in Strasburg. Is that how you pronounce that? Colorado. Although she enjoyed her time in Strasburg, she moved to the eastern prairies of Colorado in 2014 to be closer to her husband, James. You know, I've got some attachment to eastern Colorado. My great-grandfather and grandmother are buried in La Junta. He worked for the railroad there. How about that? Morrison, I'm a quarter Swedish. Continuing her work in Lyman, Dr. Bledsoe was able to develop relationships with many local producers. It was here she realized her passion for working with commercial livestock producers. She enjoys the challenge of setting up effective, customized herd health plans that increase production and efficiency for each operation. She continues to love the adventure, now listen to this, caring for over 85,000 plus livestock patients who are spread over 7,300 square miles. Makes my little practice area of 50 miles look pretty small. Dr. Bledsoe is involved in her community and serves as mayor of Hugo, Colorado, is a past president of the Lincoln County Cattle Women, an acting member of the Lincoln County Stock Growers, and on the board of directors for the Hugo Fire Protection District. She also is an appointed member of the Colorado Veterinary Medical Association Commission on Advocacy and Outreach and the American Medical Association Committee on Veterinary Technician Education and Activities. When not on the road, Dr. Bledsoe can be found helping her husband on the family's Red Angus cow-calf operations. In addition to her livestock, she and her husband raise Australian shepherds. Would you give a warm warning? Warning, not a warning. <laughs> Would you give a warm welcome to Dr. Bledsoe? <laughs> Maybe a warning, too. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I need a warning. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for inviting me back this year. Um, if, we, if you attended our CAF convention last year, uh, you heard me talk then as well, and hopefully you weren't too bored because we're going to do a, a 201 of last year's 101 presentation. I think we're going to check the sound really quick. I think I'm just going to use this microphone. And I can, I can talk while he's checking the sound as well. So I don't know if any of you... Uh, had an appreciation for your veterinarian's veterinary degree before Dr. Max's excellent presentation dealing with a lot of complicated information on mRNA. But vet school is like that, but eight hours a day for four years. <laughs> so if you like that, go ahead and, and sign up for vet school. <laughs> However, if FMD were diagnosed today, yes. state and federal officials would turn to you. Okay, I have, a, I have a video, so we have to make sure that the vi audio works. Okay.
Okay, got to always throw a wrench in it with a Mac. Okay, so my presentation this year will be steering through the cattle care conundrum, the government, the local vet, and you. Um, there's been a lot of changes recently with a lot of legislation that have, has come down the pass, and it's affecting both the local veterinarian and you, um, and it's coming from the government, so we're going to kind of work through those, um, those issues today. So if you look into the past, um, the way that regulations came through to our industry was more governed by the producer and the issues that became an, a problem at the producer level being shared and up the chain to, through the local veterinarian and then to the government. And then policies would be changed and accommodated um, at that level in response to the feedback that the producers and the local vet veterinarians were given. So if something would happen, local level, you'd share it with your local vet, the local vet would share it with the state vet, the state vet would then go to the government, and policies and procedures would be changed accordingly. I think that everyone can say now that we don't feel like that is what's happening uh, in current days. Now it seems like all the legislation is being, starting at the government level, it's coming down to your local vet, your local vet's sharing that information with you and you're having to change accordingly to that. And I I've had a lot of clients come up to me and say, why, why is this the case? This isn't how it used to always be. What's going on now? Why is it different? And I would say that this would be the explanation. And I think that if any of you attended Tracy's pre presentation yesterday, I think you can understand these players and, and who they are and how they do not necessarily have our best interests at heart. But it's the reality is that previously, the pressure on the government came from a robust agricultural industry that was dictating policy change. Now the pressure is coming from outside sources that are some within our industry, some without. We've got the big four. We've got the World Health Organization has a very invested interest in how we use our antibiotics. The Global Sustainable Roundtable, or the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef also has a huge impact, and the World Trade Organization has also dictated our veterinary policy within this country. So those influences are what's dictating policy, and it's trickling downstream instead of trickling upstream like it had previously. So what does that mean? Um, it means that there's a different uh, pressure point and a different tipping point in the industry now than there has been previously. And I feel I can speak, this, speak on this personally because I am the local vet. I may not be your local vet, but I am a local vet for all of my producers. And I feel very much in the middle, pulled between the government and between all of you. And right now, um, the government has, the government carries a big stick. They can set the regulations, they can award or revoke my veterinary licenses, they can fine and penalize me if I do not follow their rules. But my heart and my uh, passion lies with my producers. I did not get into veterinary medicine to serve the government. I got into veterinary medicine to serve all of you. And so my customers, they, they support my livelihood. I would not be able to go out and do what I do without my customers. The government is not paying my bills. And so I, I have a financial uh, uh, agreement with all of my producers. I have a financial liability to them if I want to continue to produce or continue to be a veterinarian. I also am, am their neighbors. I know my clients by first name. I run into them at the grocery store. I run into them you know, throughout my community at fair. And we have a shared passion for the industry, for the animals. We go out there and we dictate our lives by the animals every single day. We have that in common. And so right now we have the veterinarian and the producers share a, 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 a livelihood, a passion, and a way of life. But um, I hate to say this, that this might not always be the case. 
And if we don't take significant action to preserve that relationship moving forward, it might not be that way. And so that's what I'd like to talk about for the rest of this presentation. So uh, small animal medicine. I know that you might not think this applies to you, <laughs> but we're gonna talk about it. Because small animal medicine is the sheep industry of veterinary medicine for me right now. So if you take that as well, we've heard a lot about the sheep industry being kind of a canary in the coal mine for the beef industry. Small animal medicine is the canary in the coal mine for large animal medicine. So historically, <clears throat> excuse me, small veterinary owned practices have what has comprised most of small animal medicine for generations. There are you know, one veterinarian, two veterinarians, maybe three veterinarians in a small community or even in an urban area own their own practice and they're their own entity until recently. <clears throat> recently, there's been a large trend in small animal medicine for large corporate consolidated firms to buy out these small practices and make large chains. And you might not even know about it if you live in an urban or suburban area, they might still retain the original name of the practice, but they're owned by large corporate firms. And these firms make those veterinarians their staff members, not their owners. And so right now in 2022, and it's only gotten worse since then, I haven't gotten 2023 numbers, but 50% of all small animal practice revenue is generated by corporate owned practices. And experts expect this trend of consolidation to continue into the future. The results of this, I don't know if you've ever gone to any of these corporate practices, is the prices have not gone down for the small animal owners. And the personalized care has not gone, gotten any better. <laughs> it's, there's, because you're in this corporate situation, there's corporate policies that ensue. So there's very much a prescription typed way of doing everything. There's not a customized approach to your individual situation. There is a large uh, trend towards encouraging pet owners to have pet insurance. And there's a large trend towards having uh, like year annual memberships and plans so that you pay yearly for your veterinary care. Okay, so you might say, well, that's small animal medicine. What the heck does it have to do with us? This is the part of where I tell you what it's gonna do. <laughs> so in Colorado, this year, we have had a push to establish a position in veterinary medicine similar to a physician's assistant in human medicine. It would require substantially less schooling than a, a doctor of veterinary medicine would, and this person would potentially be able to diagnose, develop treatment plans, prognose, and perform basic surgery. They would still have to work under a licensed veterinary veterinarian. So the good thing is, is they're going to say it's going to relieve the veterinary so shortage and it's going to decrease the veterinary cost to you. So, I mean, rainbows and unicorns, right? That solves all of our problems because lots of people say we don't have a vet and we need a vet. Okay, what's the catch? So my dad, growing up, my dad, whenever he was trying to explain the government to me, he would always say this, follow the money. <laughs> so that I'm going to tell you, follow the money. So um, this is being pushed by my alma mater, which I'm not at all proud of, Colorado State University, animal rights groups, and corporate veterinary chains. So those people are always your friends, right? <laughs> so so let's, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's a good solution. So it's opposed by the Colorado Veterinary Medical Association, which is a group of all veterinarians in Colorado, and also the American Veterinary Medical Association. We're lockstep on this and opposing it. And the thing to me is that the, Colorado, the universities will benefit from being able to offer another degree path that they can charge students to go to. People that couldn't get into vet school, they can say, oh wait, we've got another option for you. Come give us some more money and get this degree. So they've got an invested interest in it, follow the money. Animal rights groups are invested in it because they feel that they do not have enough access to spay and neuter. And if they could get uh, un less, or people out there, practitioners out there that require less training, they can push spay and neuter and push spay and neuter volumes as high as they want to go. And corporate veterinary chains, because corporate veterinary chains are spending a lot of money hiring veterinarians to do veterinary work. And if they can hire six uh, mid-level mid practitioners instead of six veterinarians and just have one veterinarian that oversees them, then that means more money in their pockets. Do you think it's gonna reduce your prices? Do you think they're gonna reduce cut costs? I would doubt it. Okay, so local vets, however, if we're following the money, are unlikely to be able to hire mid-level practitioners. We're struggling to hire technicians as it is. If we, I mean, if I had the opportunity where I could afford to hire another vet or a technician, I would. I don't work with another vet or another technician because of how the financial structure of my practice is. So local vets probably can't afford to pay them. Corporate chains probably can. Um, this is my, the scenario that keeps me up at night. 
So corporate chains come out into a rural area and they hire a lot of these mid-level practitioners and they put them under one veterinarian. That veterinarian doesn't necessarily have to be in your state, could be in California, could be wherever, and then that person just has to hold a license in your state, but they don't necessarily have to be your, necessarily your, know your veterinarian, know you very well, they just have to supervise the mid-level practitioners. Then that corporate veterinary chain that, has, that hires this group of people can lower their prices enough to run your local veterinarian out of business. Okay, well, ranchers are very price sensitive individuals. You guys are, are frugal people. You say, well, I can get this work done cheaper. I'm gonna go over here. Well, your vet goes out of business. And then once all the market, all the comp competition is out of the market, do you think they're gonna keep your prices low? I doubt it. And they already have a method for how they can say, well, we would like you to hold some insurance. We would like you to pay for a plan and have a yearly membership to our practice. Where else are you gonna go? Everyone else is out of business. So they make it seem like a good idea at first because they're saving you money, and then all of a sudden you give up your power and control and your opportunity and your choice, and then you're stuck with whatever they're gonna give you. So why do you care? So currently this is where, where it is, the tug of war. We're in the middle, the government, the producers. I don't think you want it to look like this. I don't think you want the corporate and corporate vet and the government on one side and you on the other. Because it is much easier to control, you know, veterinarians are an independent thinking bunch. We're fairly outspoken, we're educated, we're generally respected in the public, and we make up our own minds. But if we're one cog in the wheel of a corporate machine that is not necessarily financially motivated or locally aligned or passionate about you, it is very easy for the government to bring us over to their side of the fence. It is very easy for them to dictate what we should and should and should not be doing. And it doesn't matter so much what you think anymore. Because if I'm just one vet in California and I have a bunch of mid-level practitioners on the ground with you, if, if they're not toting the line, I can just fire one of them and hire another one. I've never met you and I don't really care. I don't live in your town. There's not a lot of motivation there for me to be concerned about the issues that concern you. Ultimately, it's easier for me if you were just all owned by one corporate entity and I had six clients to deal with instead of 20. And so you have to make sure that your veterinarian's ideals and motivations stay aligned with you, otherwise you are going to lose an ally in this fight very quickly. Okay, so if you aren't convinced yet, we're gonna do a couple of little side problems that we're gonna have and consider how well you could deal with them if you don't have a veterinarian ally on your side. So the trouble with traceability. We talked a little bit about this last year and this is how I'm gonna link into my presentation last year. <coughs> so do you remember what of all the animal diseases foreign to the US present the greatest threat to livestock industry? Who remembers from last year? Foot and mouth. Foot and mouth is the one disease that the government is so, 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 so scared of. And that is why they are very motivated to promote traceability. But the thing is, there's two ways of fighting disease outbreaks. There's prevention and there's traceability. Prevention is taking a strong action to prevent disease transfer via internal travel and commerce, and it's labor intensive to government agencies. It's cost intensive to the government agencies, but it has a minimal impact and restriction on the US producers because it's primarily focused on preventing the disease from coming into the US in the first place. And it, but it does have significant trade implications on our trade partners because we're holding them accountable for what they're bringing into the country. Traceability, on the other hand, is an approach that says, well, we're just gonna give up on preventing it from coming here, we're just gonna try to track it once it gets here. And so it's focused on monitoring and restricting movements of US livestock, limiting the disease spread. It's a reaction-based response instead of a prevention-based response. And the majority of the labor and the cost is shifted to the producer because you need to track what you're doing. You need to tell what's going on. You need to know what's, how to report and how to, how to tra trace this problem. And it does nothing to reduce the economic risk to US producers because once we get this disease, it will economically impact you. And it's heavily reliant on disease detection. And this is one of my, my main arguments against traceability being a good solution because if you cannot detect a disease, you cannot trace it. And again, foot and mouth, remember this from last year? One of these is foot and mouth and one of these is foot rot. Can you tell me which one without the label? because I cannot, they are visually indistinguishable 
And you cannot tell me that you can, tell, can look at that and tell the difference. So how are we supposed to know, to, tra to notify up the chain that, oh my gosh, we have a problem? I mean, it's, a, it's been a wet summer in my area. There's tons of foot rot. Everybody's got foot rot. How do I know if it's foot rot or foot and mouth? You won't for a while. If you won't for a while, then how are you going to isolate it and trace it back? Because the longer you go without recognizing it as a problem, the harder it is to trace back and prevent from becoming a massive problem. And when a disease looks identical to foot rot on a year like this year, you can't tell me that you'll be fast to trace it back. You'll be fast to detect it. And so what's the national approach to this? So in the US, we are taking a uh, traceability approach to foot and mouth. We are not taking a prevention approach. I think if you've ever traveled to a foreign country and come back and they say, oh, well, did you, did you go to a ranch or something like that? That's generally the question they ask you at the border. And you say, oh, well, you know, no or yes or whatever. There isn't a whole lot of things. It's kind of reliant on you to self-report when you go across the border. And they don't do much to prevent you from tra tra tracing in fomites like foot and mouth. Because fo foot and mouth can live for a very long time on a variety of, on your shoes, on your clothes. And you could be tra tracking it in. And anyone else that's involved in foreign commerce and foreign trade, all these people going back and forth to Brazil and South America in these companies that are you know, having business and trade, they could be bringing fomites back with them and it's pretty much through the grace of God that we haven't gotten foot and mouth yet. And so, APHIS is gonna go the traceability route. They announced in, on January 18th, 2023, that uh, they have this proposal for the electronic identification. Again, they've been trying to push this on us for a while. The final ruling is expected in April 2024 and it could go into effect in October 2024. From all of the information and communication that I've gotten from the state level, they're pretty sure that they're gonna get this through. I even called the head of the program this week and talked with him. They've already have funds in the budget, in the, in the budget for next year for rolling out RFID programs, for budgeting for the tags. They're pretty much, com without saying straight out that they're gonna do this, they're basically communicating that they in fully intend to do this. And I'm not saying that traceability wouldn't help in other diseases, my argument is that in this disease, I do not think it's an effective approach. <clears throat> and so what would happen? So official ear tags must be visually and electronically readable for the interstate movement of all cattle and bison over 18 months of age, all dairy cattle, including offspring of dairy cattle, cattle and bison of any age used for roadie and recreation, cattle and bison of any age used for show and exhibition. So that's pretty much gonna happen, okay? In their minds, unless something radical happens in the meantime. So in the fall of next year, we could be dealing with this. So what's the next step then? You know, because it usually doesn't stop with, you know, it's a stepwise approach. They're inching down the road. Has anyone heard of the Secure Beef Supply program? Secure Beef Supply? This is a little explanation. Since 1929. However, if FMD were diagnosed today, state and federal officials would turn to USDA's Foot and Mouth Disease Response Plan, also known as the Red Book, to respond to this very contagious livestock virus. The Red Book provides guidance on setting up control areas around infected premises, which are farms with livestock that test positive for FMD. The size of the FMD control area could be as small as a six mile radius from the infected premises for one farm, or very large, such as an entire region if several farms have positive animals. Movement controls will be put in place in the control area to limit FMD spread. This will include moving animals between premises and two packing plants. How would that affect your business? This brings us to the need for the Secure Beef Supply Plan. The SBS plan provides a continuity of business plan for cattle operations in control areas that are affected by movement controls but not infected with FMD so they can continue to move cattle. Cattle ranchers, feedlot operators, livestock transporters, and packers rely on cattle movements to provide quality beef products to grocers and consumers. The SBS plan provides guidance for moving cattle that have no evidence of FMD infection to harvest and to other premises, which could minimize lost income across sectors of the beef industry. The SBS plan provides guidance for an operation with no evidence of FMD infection to move cattle between premises and two packing plants. It is the result of years of collaboration between the beef industry, universities, states, and USDA. Participation is voluntary. 
The SBS plan, funded by USDA, also provides resources to help producers protect their herd from FMD exposure. The full seven-page plan can be found on the Secure Beef Supply website at securebeef.org. The SBS plan recommends getting a National Premises Identification Number, referred to as a PREM ID or PIN, for any operation that houses animals. PINs can be requested from the office of your state animal health official. The PIN includes a valid 911 address and a set of matching coordinates, the latitude and longitude, reflecting the actual location of the animals on the premises. Having a validated PIN speeds up communication and response during an outbreak. Routine biosecurity is not enough when it comes to protecting cattle from FMD exposure. The SBS plan includes biosecurity guidance based on how FMD spreads. Producers can work with their herd veterinarian and use a self-assessment checklist, corresponding information manual, and template to develop an operation-specific, written, enhanced biosecurity plan. These resources are all available on the Secure Beef Supply website. Okay, so that's a video from their website about what they do. Um, it is its own, um, it's a dot org, it's kind of running under its own title right now, but it is funded by the USDA Plant Inspection Service, US, uh, APHIS. And then they say its intent is to speed up a successful foot and mouth disease response and an eventually enable an issuance of movement per permits after the extent of the outbreak is understood. This will support a continuity of business for cattle producers, transporters, packers, processors, and allied industries who choose to participate. And it's voluntary for now, kind of like the RFID was voluntary for then. And it's the key here is the those who choose to participate part. Because if we do have an outbreak and they are slow to find it, and then they finally make a containment area, and you are within the containment area, and you do not have a secure beef supply plan, you aren't moving. You aren't going anywhere and the markets are gonna crash around you and you cannot move your cattle and you cannot sell them. So you're stuck. And yes, the government will come and repay you for your losses when things are all said and done, but it's not going to be at high market prices. <laughs> So this is an important thing to understand about where we are going and the importance of the relationship you have with your veterinarian. Because in that situation, navigating this paperwork, navigating the problem, navigating your solution, and ensuring a speed to market so that you can get some of your money back is going to be very key to the essence of whether your operation survives or dies right then. So the SBS plan provides guidance only. In an actual outbreak, decisions will be made by the responsible regulatory officials based on the unique characteristics of the outbreak. So it's guidance only. They could say, oh, thanks for doing that. We're, not, we're changing the rules on you. We're done with that plan, but thanks, for, thanks anyways. And it is only usable for premises with no evidence of foot and mouth infection in an outbreak. If you actually show positive, that you have a whole different set of rules. So what's the state of Colorado doing with this? So the state of Colorado sent me out of an email because I'm a vet in Colorado and they said that, well, the USDA um, has awarded Colorado some grant money and we're gonna assist the feedlots in making this plan. They have a second year vet student that's gonna be doing this. I crossed out her name so you don't attack her. She's probably harmless. Um, and, oh, I forgot the second name, but she, you don't have her last name. Okay, and they're gonna visit numerous feedlots this summer and assist with writing secure beef plans with the feedlot managers. And so the feedlots will all be ready to go. I don't see anything in there about going over to all the producers and making sure that they have a plan. I guess you're on your own. Okay, so if you want to learn more about that, it's securebeef.org, check it out. Next, on to the next problem that you might need a veterinarian for. Um, antibiotic stewardship regulations. So June 2023, the FDA pushed for medically important antibiotic drug classes for human medicine that are currently over the counter for animals to be prescription only. I've had a lot of feedback from clients. I've had a lot of you ask me questions about this over the last year. So now these medications will go from being over the counter to be requiring a prescription. To get a prescription, you have to have a veterinary client pa patient relationship before purchasing. So what does that mean? So, I mean, the vast majority of the antibiotics that are available to you now, the new antibiotics, are prescription anyway. So if you've been getting Draxin, if you've been getting Suprivo, Zactran, all of those things were prescription anyways, and this is kind of moves all antibiotics into this category. Um, the only antibiotics that changed were oxytetracyclines, penicillins, sulfas, tylosin, and, and uh, the today and tomorrow type of products. So 
Um, I've had a lot of pushback. I've had a lot of people mad about this change. But in the reality, the only thing that changes is that you can't purchase these things from the feed store anymore. You can still purchase them um, from your veterinarian, and you can still purchase them um, through the large corporate supply companies like Animal Health International, Valley Vet, so long as you have a prescription from your vet. And you can get a prescription from your vet so long as you have a relationship with your vet. And so my question to you is, why on earth don't you have a relationship with your vet? I mean, if you want these products, you should have a relationship with your vet. As long as your vet has been out to your, uh, out to your place in the last year and, has, and you do business with them, they should be able to write you a prescription and you should be able to go on with business as normal. But I've had a lot of producers say, the vet just wants to make more money off of us. And that's kind of, it, do, it does burn me because when I, I, I do a lot to fight for my clients. I'm passionate about my clients. I want my clients to be successful in addition to our community and my business being successful. And I think that that's perfectly reasonable that we can all be successful together. But it is, a, again, a top-down top uh, regulation. The local vets didn't go to the government and say, gosh, we really want to stick it to our producers. So could you please make these prescription only? So I really encourage you not to take this, your frustrations out on your local vet. I don't think that aids in the relationship that you have with them. And um, if you have a quality working with relationship with your veterinarian, you should already have a VCPR established. I think that you, I also consider, you know, a price comparison between your veterinarian, the online pharmacy, and the local feed stores. Oftentimes when I into my, went into my local feed stores, they were upcharging uh, any of the drugs there by 20, 30% more than what I charged my clients. And oftentimes veterinarians will price match the online pharmacies because they want to be competitive. And so instead of saying, you just want to make money off of me, maybe say to your vet, are you willing to price match my online pharmacies? Because that's at least a way that you can still do business with your vet and buy local. So what kind of client are you? Are, and this, is the stu this is, might be a little tough love situation for you guys, okay? So bear with me. Are you seeking your vet's advice and perspective on, changing, on the changing legislature? Or are you accusing your vet of being a money-hungry crook? Are you formulating a proactive herd plan for both prevention and treatment? Or are you only calling your vet one or two times a year for an emergency? Are you sourcing your medications and vaccines from the vet? Or are you sourcing your medications and vaccines from large companies? Because you can go and you know, buy your groceries at Walmart, or you can go and buy your groceries at your local, at your local grocer. It's your option, but do not be upset if your local grocer goes out of business. Do not be upset if your local vet goes out of business. Do not be upset if your local vet no longer wants to fight the, your fight for you anymore because you're no longer aligned. It's your choice. You can pick. And then are you standing up to help veterinarians protect their profession against things like mid-level practitioner, or you're selling out your veterinarian for short-term savings on your operation? These are all choices that you have to make, and I'm not going to make them for you. But I do encourage you to consider, are you going to be on the team with your veterinarian, or are you not? Because it is up to you. And so these are my opportunities. My speeches tend to be a little bit you know, depressing or downtrodden when I have to break all this bad news. But I do like to end with the opportunities that you have to make it better. So educate yourself and others about the ramifications of losing a productive relationship with your veterinarian. And then watch for evolutions of programs like the beef supply pro or the beef secure beef supply program and others like it because I don't think it's going to be the last one that comes down the pike. EID is a barrier to movement, and a barrier mo to movement is a barrier to market. And a barrier to market in an uh, emergency situation could mean the death of your operation. Will the government continue to abuse power and restrict your access to EIDs and PINs and and movement in an emergency because you don't want to play their game? And then also advocate for greater preventative efforts to protect our country from foreign disease showing up here in the first place, against any manipulation or discrimination and access to the markets, against legislation that will run local vets out of business. And please support your local vet. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them, but we're running short on time. Go ahead.
Um, a lot of factors come into play in that. Um, I think some of it is that the vet schools are not allowing students that have a production animal background into the vet clinic or into the vet schools. And they're thinking that they can turn small animal vets into large animal vets in vet school. And that's not really the case, and I can speak to that because I didn't come from a large animal background. I didn't come from a production animal background. My mom is a teacher and my dad is a contractor, and I didn't know a dairy cow from a beef cow until I got into college. And so I did an animal science schooling, and I developed a passion for all of you folks and the industry. And I learned what I needed to learn about the production basis of the industry in undergrad, and then I learned what I needed to do to be a veterinarian in vet school. You can't teach both in vet school. A lot of that, the veterinarian might be aging up and they don't have the physical ability to do large animals anymore. Other times they can't attract new veterinarians that are interested in doing uh, large animal practice because we're not graduating veterinarians that are interested in doing large animal practice. A lot of that is the financial impact of, you know, if it is much more financially lucrative to do small animal in your area than it is to do large animal, then they're gonna, the, their business models are gonna have to respond to that. So I would just make sure that you're, you and other producers in your area are supporting the vet and that's through, not just, again, not just through calling them once or twice a year, but actively having a relationship with them, seeking to buy your medications from them, making sure that their businesses are healthy and performing because if they have a healthy and robust business then they might be able to attract more large animal vets to their clinic. Go ahead. Uh, just the large animal vets? I think that in general, there is a lot of propaganda coming from the government level to convince them that it's a good idea. And I think that those relationships, I mean, that's another way that it's so important that you have a good relationship with your vet, because if you have a good relationship with your vet and they aren't as educated on this topic as, as some people are, they will trust your judgment on, on saying like, hey, this isn't great for my production and these are the five reasons why. They're gonna take your point of view and they're gonna digest that and evaluate it themselves. But if you do not have a good relationship with them, if you're one of those people that only use them once or twice a year and complain that they're, you're charging too much money and they, that you're, you're mad that you have to get a VFD and why are you even here, they're not gonna listen to your point of view. You're, you're starting at a deficit and you might as well just keep your mouth shut because you know if you're gonna be that person that's negative to your vet and and making a, a negative relationship with them, you're doing more harm than help in the vast, vast scheme of things. But if you're, if one of my trusted clients that I have a good relationship to, with comes to me and tells me about a side of an issue that I didn't think of, most vets will consider that because we're pretty independent thinkers. So as far as your question is, if, if the government's tracking what you're buying and there might be any blowback from buying too much of one thing or too much of another, I think as long as you have a good relationship with your vet and your vet has a documented, you know, they say, I understand their operation, this is what's going on, they're having a big foot rot outbreak or they're having a big E. coli outbreak and this is what they need for that. I mean, it, it, it's all, a lot of respect is given within the chain to veter local veterinarians in that way too because we're the boots on the ground. We are the ones that determine whether something is a problem, whether it's not, how to treat it. That's our expertise. And so if we have a relationship with you and we trust that this is what you need and this is what we gave you, then th the questioning pretty much stops there at this point because as long as it's a responsible choice as deemed by the local vet and the vet, you know, state vet or regional vet, that is considered a good answer. But there might be some bad eggs out there that want to play the game and, and abuse it I'm not going to say that the government won't have a problem with that, but if you are having a situation where you do, do need that, and, and different vets can take a different approach to this because there's not a lot of specific regulation in how, what, what is a VC part? It changes in every state. What is, you know, how much antibiotic do they need to have on hand? Some vets are not comfortable with providing a lot of antibiotic to you. I personally have a huge practice area. I can't be at everyone's place to look at every sick animal. So I, my good clients will call me you know, before calving and be like, okay, well, if I have, you know, a uterine prolapse, I'm probably gonna need this. If I have a sick calf, I'm probably gonna need this. And it's my preference that I make sure that they have all those things on hand so when something happens, they can address it right away because that's the th best thing for the animal's health, not to suffer and wait until I can get there to, to get antibiotics. 
And so having drugs on hand is not something that I think is a problem for producers. If they're stockpiling it and selling it all to their neighbors, that would not be okay. <laughs> but none of my good producers would do that to me because we have a good relationship and they understand that my license is on the line. I know Laura's gonna be around the rest of the convention, so if you've got further questions, please, uh, please seek her out. And we uh, always appreciate, you always say you bring the gloom, I think you bring the information. <laughs> so thank you. Um, folks, thank you. we're gonna take, absolutely, yes. <laughs>